in our life. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's go to Jude, the little book right before the book of Revelation. It's only one chapter. And we'll go to verse three. We're in a new series called Earnestly Contending for the Faith. Today's the second part. I wanna talk about raw Bible faith, just raw Bible faith. And hear what I'm saying. This is not a complaint. It's not anything other than to point something out and to put it on our radar screen. One man of God said years ago, he said, mental ascent has dressed up, looked like faith, made its way into the church and deprived it of its power. What is mental ascent? Mental ascent says the word of God is true. I believe it. It is the word of God, but it's primarily what used to be or what's going to be. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse one says, now faith is. Now faith is. And so we're gonna talk about this thing called raw Bible faith because every one of you have it. When you got saved, God gave to you the measure of faith. But you have to develop that faith. That you, in the Bible, you see things from little faith all the way to a great faith to exceedingly growing faith. And so faith is not something that just comes automatically, but it's something that we develop in. And I wanna make the distinction between human faith and Bible faith, genuine Bible faith. Nobody struggled to have faith that that chair would hold you up today. Did anybody struggle with that? You know, like, oh my, I hope that thing's gonna hold me up. Think about it. You had human faith coming here today as you were driving down the road and you're going 55 miles an hour and somebody is coming exactly the opposite direction. The only thing separating you two is a yellow line. That's a combined speed of 110 miles an hour. You had human faith, that person that you don't even know is gonna stay in their lane. Following me? So human faith is something that you develop over time. And when we learn to walk, for instance, because we walk by faith and not by sight, that's something we have to learn. So our little granddaughter, Caroline, is learning to walk. She's doing an awesome job. So I got some slides up here. Let's do that all together now. Oh, there we go. That's a little better. So this should only take 30 minutes or so for these (laughs) slides right here. So there's little Caroline. And this was at our family gathering up in Green Mountain Falls. And I was just watching her and look at that. Now she's kind of moving into the run stage a little bit. And I should have really got some video and showed you because she, and there's Luke handing off the football to her and uh, she took it and then she's headed for the goal line right there. And you know, there was a couple of times I saw her fall, but you know, we don't go over there and it's like, Caroline, why'd you fall? You stumbled, you failed. No, we celebrate. In fact, when they fall, we celebrate it even more. We focus on the fact she's walking, she's stepping. And this is some of what I wanna share with us today. There's three things, in case we don't get to all of them, I'm gonna tell them to you now. So number one, make knowing him, the Lord, the aim of your faith. Make knowing him the aim of your faith. Not to get things, because the Lord said, look, here's the key to getting things. Seek first the kingdom of God, and my righteousness, and then I'll add all the things to you. So make knowing him. Mark chapter 12, verse 29, it's the, what is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, not part, all of our heart, all of our soul, mind, will, and emotions, all of our mind, all your mind, and all your strength. And the word heart is where we get the word Cardiac, it's the word cardia, spelled with a K. What does your heart do? 
It's the center of your being, so to speak, figuratively. Every drop of blood in your body goes through your heart. Everything in life should go and center around, my heart is focused on the Lord, because without him, there is no life. Without him, there's nothing. Life's nothing. It's not worth a thing. You can taste success to the highest degrees, and when you get that next thing you want, you're gonna be empty still until you feel that. So love him with all your heart, then with all your soul, That's your mind, will, and emotions. I'm fascinated just looking at God's creation. You can look at something and it it causes you to reflect on the goodness of God, the glory of God, because everything that's created reveals his glory. Then with all your mind, that Greek word is deep thought. Now, if you just took this one thing I'm about to say and run with this, this will change your life forever. It will revolutionize. Deep thought. Love the Lord your God with your deep thoughts. Some people said, well, I don't know if I can do that. I don't think of myself as a deep thinker. Oh, yes, you are. You think deep. Deep thinking is really the meditations of your heart. How many has ever been wronged by somebody and you just couldn't shake it? They should have never done that. I can't believe they did that. Things that happened 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and people are still rehearsing it. Those are deep thoughts. But the word even shifts us to say, don't think on that. Think on things that are true and just and lovely, pure, honest, good report. And then he said, look, if there's anything that has virtue, power to give life, think on that. So you're a deep thinker, whether you know it or not, you do it without trying. And if you would insert the word of God into that loving the Lord your God with your mind, your deep thoughts, that's when things begin to change radically. And then lastly, with your strength. What, what has God gifted you to do? When a worshiper is worshiping God and not performing thinking of Ivan Tate, your dad. I had him teach, had him come because he told me, I said, you gotta come share that with the worship team, the invisible worshiper. The worshiper's job is to be invisible. Some you can see and it's like, that's a performance. That's not worship. That's a performance. It's, It's there to exercise a gift, and I get it. There's nothing wrong with that. No, we're there to point it to him. Give him glory. That opens the doors for him to come in and inhabit our praises. Love the Lord with all your strength. You may be a carpenter, a plumber, a builder. Whatever it is, you do it. I've seen guys in hotels that cook and man, it's like, wow, I just want to watch this guy. I mean, they, they love what they do. I walked into a hot dog stand one time. I was feeling like I'm just going to fall off this here keto wagon, go get me a hot dog. You know, a Chicago hot dog. Yeah. I visited Pastor Louis Reyes in Chicago. He said, I'm taking you to where they have Chicago hot dogs like you have never had. Makes me want to go visit him just so I could go to the hot dog shop. So I go to this hot dog shop and I walk in. I'm like, hey, how are y'all doing? And the guy goes, living the dream. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) If you can live a dream and live the dream in a hot dog shop, man, something's going on good there. Whatever we do, we give him glory and honor. So make him, knowing him, the aim of your faith. Number two, we wanna talk about make the word of God your daily bread. Too many read it just because they're supposed to. They did a survey one time. Pastors primarily open the book to get a sermon. No, it's supposed to be our daily bread. Just shy, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. How many of you, you know, people say, well, I don't have time to study the Bible. Then the question is, do you have time to eat food? Huh, bless the Lord God Almighty. We make time for that. And that's exactly the point. The Lord says, you make time. It's not optional. 
And the third thing we want to talk about, don't be afraid to fail. Fear is your arch enemy and it does not belong to you. God did not give you and I the spirit of fear. What did he give us? Love, power, and a sound mind. So let's read this scripture in verse three of Jude. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So when it says the common salvation, the first thing we wanna make sure we know, it doesn't mean that our salvation is just ordinary, run of the mill or normal. Bible talks about what you and I have been given is an unspeakable gift with unsearchable treasures. But what he was saying is the common salvation is it's available to everybody. Whosoever will can come and drink freely of the water of life. So the common salvation, and he wanted to write about this, but he said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So this is what we have to get a hold of. There's no first century faith and then a 21st century faith. It was the faith once delivered. And what he says right here, Jude is saying, fight for it, earnestly contend for it. Put the scripture back up there because the word earnestly contend, if you look at that Greek word, you can see the word agonize in it, agon. Agon, it's where we get the word agonize and the picture is two men in a wrestling match. The best way I know to describe it is you would have to turn on one of the modern day MMA events, mixed martial arts. The majority end up on the ground. They call it grappling. You and I have to grapple for our faith. Faith is a fight. The enemy is after your faith. He doesn't care what you do. He doesn't care how many churches are planted, how many churches are packed to capacity. As long as they're full of lukewarm preachers and lukewarm believers, he's happy. Because lukewarm will not work with the Lord. Some people think, well, you know, lukewarm's better than ice cold. I mean, you know, no, not according to Jesus. He said, if there's no repentance to the lukewarm believer, I'm gonna spew you out. It actually means in the Greek, vomit. You can't vomit something out that's not in you. If there's a plate of food on my table, I can't vomit it out unless I take it in. He was talking to his body. Revelation 3, verse 20, he's knocking on the door of the Laodicean church. He's on the outside looking in. And he says, can I... If you'll open the door to me, I'll come in and we'll dine together and we'll have fellowship. And most, five of the seven churches in the book of Revelation were in trouble. A lot of bad things going on there. Wrong teaching going on, seductive teaching going on, lifestyles, lukewarm, religious spirit, all of those kinds of things. And so he says, earnestly contend for the faith. So, I've said this just for the sake of pointing it out. Hope is not faith. Faith is not hope. Hope and faith are inextricably tied to one another because faith gives substance to what you hope for. It's like having a set of plans to build a house. And then you take those plans and you give it to a builder. Because if, if you ladies are gonna build a house and the builder comes in and says, well, what kind of house would you like built? You're not gonna say, well, just whatever's on your heart. <laughs> you know, many believers don't get their prayers answered because they're not specific. James said, you have not because you ask not. Well, Lord, bless me. Well, if you're saved, you're already blessed. So that's done. If you say, Lord, bless me financially, well, how much do you want? Well, I don't know. Well, if he gives you a dollar, you're blessed. Better off than you were before. It's not wrong to be specific in our prayers. And so he says, earnestly contend for the faith. So hope is involved in faith, but hope is not faith. Hope is a confident expectation. 
of something good that's going to happen. The devil's counterfeit of hope is dread. You dread doing this. You dread doing that. That's the enemy that's gotten in there somewhere and blinded because the arch enemy of every believer is fear. Fear is what I call the devil's faith. So this thing, so we have the human faith, that's developed, it's dependent upon our five physical senses and we've spent our whole life, so this morning when you came in and you didn't struggle whether or not that chair, because you're highly developed in that. You live by faith, you walk by faith in the human faith, but human faith is not what we're to earnestly contend for. There is another level and realm of faith that God has called us to and this is the shift he wants to happen. This faith will work anywhere, anytime. Bishop David says it this way. At the instance of faith, the word is converted to power. He said that prophecies are important, but he said faith is more important. Otherwise, your prophecies will remain wishes. So... Let's look at the first one here. Make knowing him the aim of your faith. Look at Philippians chapter three, verse 10. Philippians chapter three, verse 10. Now, some of the times you think when you start to obey the Lord and you go after him, all hell breaks loose. How many's ever had something like that happen? You, you know, you said, I'm just gonna follow the Lord. I'm going to another level. And all hell, it was like hell belched on your doorstep. Just... We had this, you know, I've had couples before and families that have come and they said, you know, we used to go to the first church of the deep freeze and (laughs) we got on fire for God and we came here and received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And they said, my God, ever since we've come here, all hell is broken loose. And there's times I've gone, welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah. Jesus said from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I will tell you the devil spots things in the spirit. There's no hiding from him. Just like seven sons of Siva. They saw Paul casting devils out and they saw, they know Jesus, you know, and they know about him. They didn't know him. And all of a sudden, so they said, hey, let's give that a whirl. Let's try that. So they went over to a man And they said, hey, you, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we adjure you. And it said, the man looked at them and said, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? And the Bible says, book of Acts, and he jumped on them and they fled naked and wounded. So I've got a message. I never have done it yet. I'd like to, and I want to entitle it, Who in Hell Are You? (laughs) And it's a very biblical message because when you walk by faith, that devil's going to say, I know Paul and I know Jesus. And it's like, "Uh uh-oh, I know you now. Because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives and dwells in you. And what we've had is a faulty gospel preached in America. We have converts, but we don't have disciples. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, every cre- make disciples of all nations. What did he say? Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. All this mess that's going on in our society. You can't blame the Democrats or the Republicans or the liberals or the conservatives or anything. It's, it's not any of the things I just mentioned. you. It's a Bible thing. What they call social issues, those are biblical issues. The Lord had a, everything we need to know to say about sexuality. Everything we need to know about marriage and is it Between a man and a woman? Yep, man and a woman right there in black and white. It's an open book test. And when you look at what has gone on in our society, there's only one place the church can can fix the blame and it's find the nearest mirror, look in it, and that's where it belongs, back on us. We have ceased to be salt and we've ceased to be light. Light always overcomes darkness. 
So we have to make knowing him the aim of our faith. Oh, and I want to say this. Of all the definitions of I've, I've ever heard in my life of faith, Dr. Lester Sumrall had the best. He said it this way, faith is knowing God. There's formulas, there's all these different things that you can say. The bottom line, faith is knowing God. How do you know God? You come to know him through his word. He loved us so much, he gave us his Bible. Rick Renner said this, I was speaking down at Southwest Campus to the transformation students on Monday night. So I taught on spirit, soul, and body. And I told my part of that was when I understood this, it helped me understand so much about myself and other people. You and I, first of all, are a spirit. We don't have a spirit. So we are a spirit and we have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotion. We live in a body. We're a triune being. We serve a triune God. Even nature reflects the Trinity, the triunity of God. So the spirit belongs to God, but the soul belongs to you. The soul is the battleground. I used to say the mind is the battleground. It's a whole lot more than the mind. It is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And if emotions get out of whack, if they get out of sync, it'll cause a person to violate every conviction they have. Fear will cause a person, because fear is the devil's faith, really. Job said the thing that he so greatly feared came upon him. That which I was afraid of, he said, is come unto me. So fear is a force it's a spiritual force, and you and I don't own that, so don't sign for it. I was just talking to somebody who talked about how when, faith, when fear knocks at your door and faith answers, nobody's home. Fear can go as quickly as it came. Faith is something you have to feed your faith, and it's a spiritual force. It's not a mental force. Fear is the substance of things hoped for. It's the assurance. None of this is for any other reason than to point out, we got to go for the gold on this. Bishop David says it this way, when here he is in the middle of Nigeria and has birthed a ministry, the Lord led him to the darkest place in Nigeria. You've heard me talk about, it's called Ota. And his spiritual son, Pastor Isaac in California, we've talked and I said, Isaac, I've heard him say Ota was a den of darkness. And I've heard him talk about the witches of Ota. And I said, so what is it about Ota? He said, oh, he said it was the darkest of the dark. He said the most wicked of the witches and the most powerful were in Ota. And so the Lord takes him there and said, this is the place. And he didn't like Lagos to begin with. He said, I didn't like Lagos, didn't want to go to Lagos. And the Lord said, go to Lagos. And then he said, they went to Oda. And the Lord said, this is the place, build the church there. So a lot of times, if we say, well, you know, it's kind of rough where I'm at, or, uh, well, over in this area, it's very hard, or up in this area, it's very hard. If we say that, we give license to the enemy to set up camp there. Our words bind us. Our words either work wonders or blunders because your faith, even though faith is in your spirit, man, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, your words act as the thermostat on the wall and it'll keep the power from flowing. That's why Romans 4, 17, call things that be not as though they were. God gives life unto the dead. You see it throughout the scripture. They, the Lord is always speaking life. He cursed the fig tree. Next day they came by and Peter's like, Lord, look at this fig tree you cursed. It's dead, dried up from the roots. And he said, and I say unto you, have the faith of God. It says have faith in God, but you could say have the God kind of faith, have the faith of God. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto the word, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea and shall not Doubt in his heart, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Out of that, we learn three to one, the Lord talks about our words over our believing. Thank you for that thunderous response right there. I am telling you that you've got faith in your heart because you've been given the measure of faith. When you receive Jesus, 
You've been given the measure of faith. It's the only way you can be born again. You're born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. But your mouth will either work the wonders or the blunders. It'll either increase or decrease. A friend of mine said it, life is voice activated. And it, if, if demonic powers respond to murmuring and complaining, and then on the other side, angels of the Lord hearken to the voice of his word, it stands to reason, we need to watch our words. Story after story after story after story, I could tell you of people that joked around about dying early or dying prematurely, and they did. Hokan tells the story of the Gideon men, and they, they joked about they didn't make the budget that year, and they had a private plane. They all were on that plane, and, and the story was they were, they were joking wow, we didn't make budget this year. And well, I guess we'll just have to have a plane crash on the way home. And then, and then the, the money from our uh, insurance policies will meet the budget. Do you know what happened? That plane crashed on the way home. They had a big service celebrating these great men's lives. And the wives all got together and made up what was lacking in the budget and went over it. Now, here's what I need to say. Just because you say something doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it is safe to say saying it is involved in making it happen. For with the heart, man believes, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. My dad had lymphoma, got lymphoma when I was 18 months old. And his friends were telling him, Richard, you got one foot, you look like you got one foot in the grave. My brother worked at MD Anderson actually and pulled out his old records and said, bro, it was a miracle we even had a dad. But you know what my dad did? He wasn't, we were Lutherans. We didn't, you know, we weren't Pentecostal word of faith, running the aisles, word of faith stuff and all that. But my dad was, this is the way he was when he went to World War II. He went down below the deck when they sailed out with the Statue of Liberty and they said, Richard, why aren't you out there? And why aren't you gonna watch as we go by? He goes, uh, I'm not gonna look at that till I get back and I will come back. And all of him and his brothers made it supernaturally. Well, they had a praying mother. That, but my dad always spoke life. When they would tell him, Richard, it looks like you got one foot in the grave. He'd say, I'm gonna outlive every one of you. That was just who he was. Words are powerful, whether you're a saint or a sinner, saved or unsaved, be careful what you say. I could spend a week talking about how people's words really cause trouble or moved mountains. The second thing, make the word of God your daily bread. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. This is... Just to understand, faith is not complicated. Faith is not some far out there, something or other that you could never reach. Faith is simple to the point when Jesus pulled the young child in front of him, he said, except you be converted like this, this child here, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. When, when Linda and I get around little Caroline and Clara, I just see the just the innocence of their heart. They just, it's so simple and uncomplicated. They don't worry about the, the house payment. They don't worry about the electric bill. They don't worry about the economy, the stock market. It's just like, they're kind of carefree. They're believers. We're all born believers. You have to be taught to not believe or wounded or rejected or or betrayed or whatever, the enemy is out. That's why he's after our schools like he is with all of this absolute evil that is being perpetrated on them. I wanna do something about it. I'm not gonna sit back and watch that. If there's anything I can do, and I know there's many of you do the same thing, for God's sake, the devil molesting those children mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise, and in this nation of all places, and pastors that don't want to talk about it, I do not get that. I don't want that on my resume when I stand before the Lord. 
These are not all the social issues. They're called biblical issues. And every one of us will give account for what we do or fail to do. Because silence is as evil, and in my opinion, silence is more evil than the perpetrators. Because if we speak truth and light and bring the spirit of faith into this thing, there's no stopping the Lord. So the second thing, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Keep that up for just a minute. The key to this verse is the word, word. The word of God. So the Greek word, there's a word logos, like logo. So you see a logo of a car company or a computer company. That logo is representative of But behind that logo may be a Fortune 500 company with billions of dollars, with very complex things going on. So the word of God is God's love to us. He loved us so much, he wrote it down. Now here's the key to the word. The logos, it's, if you put that back up where it says the word, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that word in the Greek is this little word called rhema, R-H-E-M-A. That means the quick and living spoken word. How do you get from the logos or logos to the rhema? And I believe it is through the study and meditation of the word. So first you read the word, then you study the word, and then you meditate the word. And you're an expert meditator. Is that a word? You a meditator? You're a meditator. You just get, you need to get the right thing in your meditator. (laughs) If you will take and put the word of God, the logos in your meditator and think on it, it will begin to extract the power, the nutrition, the life, the light, because in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And if the word was God, the word is God. And Jesus, that's why he could say things that freaked people out. (laughs) Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life into you. There were people that went, Many left off following him and followed him no more. And even some of his close associates couldn't handle that. Except, he said, the words that I speak unto you, they're spirit and they are life. In John 6, 63, where he said the words, it's that little word rhema. This is not complicated. It's for whosoever will. It's for every believer. That's why Jude called it common salvation. This is for every one of you. Faith, God is no respecter of persons, but you do need to know he is a respecter of faith. How can he be a respecter of faith? Because it's available to all. You could be a member of the Aborigines in some part of the world, Africa, China, India, Iceland, wherever you may live, whosoever will may come. And that blesses me because there's people that are a whole lot smarter than I am, a whole lot more gifted than I am, a whole lot more better positioned than I am. But if I get this thing called faith coming alive in me, God will pass over 7 billion people to get to me. Faith is how we please God. And it's the only way we please him. Charles Spurgeon said, nobody ever outgrows scripture. The book widens and deepens with our years. Psalm 34 verse eight says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I really believe, you know, God didn't have to make us with a physical body that we needed to eat food. You know what? I mean, we could just be human beings. We, don't have, we didn't have to eat. One day I was watching the Food Channel and <laughs> one of my favorites. <laughs> I like Triple D, it's my favorite show. Diners, drive-ins and dives. <laughs> Man, I'm like, hey, we need to take a note on this one. I, I think we need to go to Podunkville, Mississippi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the food on there, it's like, You start salivating. 
you know, little hole in the wall. I mean, I can't, I'm starting to have visions of God watching that thing sometimes. <laughs> but you know when you're really hungry and you just, you go somewhere like, I, I love steak, beef steak. Lord help you all that don't like steak, but I'll make up for it. But I love steak. Kind of a tip off, isn't it? My last name is Cow Art. Cow Art. So anyway, I remember one time my favorite cut is a filet. And if I get everything I really like, a baked potato, a salad, and ice cold, fresh brewed tea with a lemon in it. And there was one time I was just really hungry and I cut that steak. They, they cooked it perfectly. And it was so tender. And I mean, I was having an experience. It was like, <laughs> there is a God in heaven. I cut that and I took a bite of that and I promise you my taste buds had a worship service. <laughs> it was like, they were like, to God be the glory. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I mean, it was like, oh Lord, you are so. And I thought of this scripture. The Lord is better than that beefsteak. The food is pathetic compared to the Lord. Nothing satisfies like him. And that's what he's saying. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And his mercy endureth forever. And it says, blessed is the man that trusts in him. We trust in about everything but him. We trust in the news. We trust in externals. We trust in people. And, and I get it, but no, trust in the Lord. Here's what Charles Spurgeon says. Man, I've grown to love this man's sermons, he, he was so, you can tell when you read Spurgeon, some of his sermons and stuff, you can just say, this man had a walk with God. But he said, the word of God will be to you a bulwark and a high tower, a castle of defense against the foe. He said, see to it that the word of God is in you, in your very soul, permeating your thoughts and so operating upon your outward life that all may know you to be a true Bible Christian for they perceive it in your words and deeds. Jesus had so much light in him that he walked by a couple of guys and said, follow me. They threw their nets down. You have to understand what they left. They threw their nets down. They left their inheritance. They left the family business. They don't know this guy. He said, follow me. And somebody said, well, that's because he's the son of God. I beg to differ with you. Yes, he's the son of God. Yes, he is God, but he was a man also. And Isaiah prophesied that when this Messiah comes, there won't be anything about him that draws us to him. He'll be like a little tender plant up out of the dry parched ground. There was nothing about him that caused us to look at him and adore him or anything like that. They didn't even have room for him at a local hotel. He was born in a barn. They put him in a feed trough. Everything about him, his own family didn't get it. They didn't even really fully get it till after he had raised from the dead. And so there should be light in us that when we walk in a room, people go, there's something different about you. And you can say, yeah, and I'd love to share it with you because there is a God vacuum in every human heart on this planet. I don't care what you say. Some things are very covered up by a lot of hurt. A lot of, lot of people that you say with a, see with a hard shell, like really hard shell, you know what usually that is? They are a very tender person. They've been very deeply wounded. And so it's kind of the old thing, if you burn me once, that's your fault. If you burn me twice, it's mine. So they just say, no more. And they put that shell up. There's a tenderness in there though. So the last thing I wanna share with you is this, don't be afraid to fail. 
the Lord promised to be with us in trouble. He never said we wouldn't have trouble. He said, I'll be with you in trouble. So look at Psalm 34, verse 19. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Now, I'm not gonna put that on my refrigerator and claim that one every day. And you don't have to. It just seems like those afflictions, trouble comes. But it's just, that's the thing we love about the word of God. Tells us like it is. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, the Lord delivers him from them all. So for anybody listening to me today, and I sense in my heart, there's some pretty intense things I'm picking up that the kind that put a little bit of a knot in your gut, take your appetite and cause you to really wonder, don't see a way out. The Lord says that there are many afflictions of the righteous, but it says here he'll deliver him from them all. I've been in those waiting rooms. I hate those things. You know, there was a time in the ministry, I'm telling you, there was in the natural no way out, none. I was waking up in the middle of the night and all I could think about was that thing staring at us right there and I'm going, everything, everything we fought for, worked for, stands to go completely down. And it was there in the natural. And I'm like, Lord, I need you to talk to me. And you know what he did? I had peace that passed all understanding. And I said, Lord, I appreciate that so very much because the scripture says, let peace be the umpire, call the shot. In other words, when you have peace, it's good. I said, I appreciate that, Lord, but would you please talk to me? Would you show me? I had peace that passed all understanding, but I did not yet see. So it was an affliction. The Lord was letting me know he's with me, but I didn't see the way out. And guess what? He delivered us out of that in a way I would have never thought possible. Saw his word come to pass. So wherever you find yourself at, don't let the enemy cause you to run or flee or give up and yield to fear. Having done all to stand, stand. Therefore, stand. God is faithful. I don't know what it is about God. There's one thing that touches him more than anything, and that's when you trust him. This faith that we're talking about, this raw Bible faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, the old King James says, faith, it, now faith is the substance. If you go to the Amplified Classic, now faith is assurance. It's a conviction. They use the word title deed. Some of you in here have bought cars over a, phone and you've never sat in it, you haven't physically laid your eyes on it, but you got the title deed coming. A title deed means it's yours. Contrary, you could have a car and not have the title deed and it's not yours, but it's saying faith is an assurance. Faith is assurance. You and I can be assured of what God has promised. But we, we have to be willing to pay the price and pray the price. Some of you remember Norval Hayes. Norval was, we used to joke about when God made Norval, he said, whoops, won't ever do that again. <laughs> I got into an elevator with him one time. He's a wealthy businessman, got saved as a Baptist, and he talked so funny. He said, well, I was driving down the road in my Cadillac. And Jesus came into my car and talked to me for an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but he did, <laughs> changed his life. And when he came in, his wife said, Norval, what happened to you? Something's different. He said, Jesus just rode with me for an hour and a half in my car. She's like, ah. 
She ended up leaving him. She says, now, Norval, I don't want to leave our social lifestyle. And she left him. And Norval went on to be a powerhouse. But you know, you know what God did him? Here he is in his three-piece suits. And he said, I had so many cars in the driveway. He liked to drove me nuts trying to keep the batteries charged. <laughs> he, he said, now, Norval, I'm going to prepare you for ministry. I want you to work the city dumps. For seven years, he worked the city dumps said, there I'd be, go out into the park, take a bag of groceries in my three-piece suit to some woman living under a tree. He'd go to the worst parts of town. He said, I prayed for people. You almost had to hold your nose. It smelled so bad in those homes. God prepared him and, and God took him into a place of faith. But he said this about it. He said, blessings from heaven don't come cheap. We live in it where, you know, we go to the fast food place and if it takes too long, you know, back in the days when I would eat strictly for convenience, I'd whip in real quick, get a hamburger. I learned to drive with my elbows and I'd have the food down before I got to back to the office. And I remember one time I went in there, well, it was after a Sunday night service. I went in and I thought, I'm hungry. I ran and got it. And it, it probably took two minutes for them to come to the window. And I'm like, what's the problem in there? <laughs> like, man, if they don't speed it up, I'm gonna ask for a manager here. Two minutes. We are so spoiled. We want it now. Microwave Christianity, microwave. The Bible says run the race with faith and patience and perseverance. Anyway, back to not being afraid to fail. The Lord promised to be with us in trouble. And so here's what I wanna share. Just like little Caroline, we don't even see when she falls. We are watching her walk. It's kind of fun, you know, I love to, you know, when they, they get to walk it and then all of a sudden you see it coming. Boom! You don't even, you don't say, Clara, why'd you fall? It's like, yay, you did. and that's the way God is looking at you today. He's not looking at all the times you've stumbled and fallen. He's looking and he goes, keep on going, get back up, keep on walking. He's with us. Abraham, the father of us all, father of faith, you will find in Genesis 12, three, it says, the Lord said this to Abraham, I'll bless them that bless you. I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth are gonna be blessed. Wow, can you imagine? I mean, God was talking to him. He said, I'm gonna do this. So if anybody curses you, Abraham, I'll curse them. Don't you worry. I am your exceeding great reward. I am your shield. That's pretty good security. And what does he do? Seven verses later, he lies to Pharaoh about his wife. And he even cut a deal with his wife. Hey, now, Sarah, you know, when, the, when they see you and they find out I'm your husband, they're gonna kill me. So how about you just tell them we're brother and sister? You know, you want to go, are you God's man of faith and power or God's man of paste and flour? <laughs> what? Pharaoh, who is that? <laughs> My sister, you want her? <laughs> God comes in and visits Pharaoh that night and he says, touch her and you're a dead man. Pharaoh came back out and rebuked Abraham. Hey, fool, you just almost got me killed. Why didn't you tell me that was your wife? That's our fearless leader right there, Abraham, man of paste and flour, I mean, faith and power. Not once did he lie, twice. Genesis 20, verse two to seven, Abimelech, it's my sister. So what I'm telling you, but so I don't know about you, but I would say that was a big stumble right there. That was staggering at the, 
what God had told him. He was staggering in his faith. But look how Romans chapter four, verse 20 records this. Talking about Abraham, it says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. In verse 21, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So what is this all about? You're on your way to being fully persuaded. You may not be there yet, but keep on going. Get back up one more time. Quit allowing the enemy to replay your failures. If it was last night, let, this is what Matt Gober used to tell all his guys at Canaan land, let your past be past at last. Leave it in the rear view mirror. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to have a glance in the rear view mirror every once in a while, but if you get stuck on the rear view mirror, you will crash. You need to turn loose of what's in the past. Listen to Psalm 91, verse 14. Here's what the Lord's saying. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he's known my name. That's you. You've set your love on him. He knew we could never measure up, so he gave us Jesus. So how does the Lord record Abraham's life? He staggered not at the promise of God. How can God say that without lying? How could the apostle Paul say that he had wronged no man? Are you with me on this with Paul? He was Saul of Tarsus, public enemy number one. He was there when they stoned Stephen, consenting to Stephen's death. Paul had people thrown in jail. Paul was a bad, bad person. The reason that he was worse and called himself even the chief of sinners, because in the name of God, he was public enemy number one to the church. And Paul said, I've wronged no man. Hey, Paul, we just caught you in a lie. We happen to know a little of your background. We happen to know Abraham's background here. But how can the word of God say that he did not stagger at the unbelief, but was fully persuaded because of the power of the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus does not cover your sin. It blots it out. Isn't that awesome? Covering something, I can pick the rug up at home and sweep the dirt under it, but it's covered. It's still there. I just need to pull the rug and there it is. God doesn't sweep your sin under the rug. When you come to him in believing faith, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. New creation is what that is. Actually, in the Greek, it means a species that never existed before. You aren't whitewashed. You aren't painted over. You aren't, you know, sanded down and given a new veneer. You are brand new. That old sin nature is taken out of you. You become a brand new person. To the point the word says, you are now the righteousness of God in Christ. And so the reason the Lord can say things like that because the old Paul died and a new, it was Saul of Tarsus, then he became Paul. So it's a brand new creation. Yep, still got the same soul, mind, will, emotions, personality, but the life force, it says before we were by nature sinful and unclean. And this is why Jude was saying, fight earnestly for this faith. Because this faith, and we'll talk more about it, this faith I'm talking about, when you and I tap the real faith, the real Bible faith, not hope, and hope's good, and we want it, and I'll be the first to tell you, get your hopes up. Don't be one of those that let people say, don't get your hopes up. If anybody tells you that, rebuke them. In love, but just let them know I rebuke you. 
say, I believe in hope against all hope. But this faith, this stuff called raw Bible faith, a mustard seed size of faith is enough to move a mountain. We've already tapped into this that it's not a lack of faith. None of us have a lack of faith. Unbelief is the kill switch. Unbelief is the thing that keeps it from functioning. That's why we have to declare war on, on, on unbelief. Look at verse 15. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. So he never said we wouldn't experience trouble, but he said, I'll be there with you. And then what he wants us to do is, now I'm with you, so don't fear in trouble. Now start tapping that faith use that faith, start speaking to the mountain, start calling things that be not as though they were. Start using what I've given to you and look at verse 16, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The devil comes with that report that you will not live long. It's the word of God. And here's what we'll close on. Good Lord. If, if one of you text me and told me you're gonna do something, I'm good. It's like, yeah, they told me they'd do it. I don't think about it ever again. Why is it when God has written in his word something that he told us he would do, we battle? I wonder if the Lord's gonna do that. It tells you it's a spiritual battle right there. It's unbelief that comes against us. But we can win this war. And when we do these three things, and that's why what Jude was saying is, even if it's like a grappling match, you got to exercise yourself. You've got to, even if it seems like agony, don't give in to the enemy. Fight the good fight of faith. Continue to press on. No matter how many times you fall, just get back up one more time. Keep getting back up and know that you're on your way to being fully persuaded. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. And I just decree and declare this word has gone forth and now you're watching over it. Can we just open our hearts up to the Lord right now? And I want you to just lift your hands. It's a Bible thing. Why do, you, why, why do you have us doing that, lifting our hands? Because the Bible says, lift up the hands that hang down. I'm tired of just seeing people at football games lift their hands. <laughs> I want to see some folks in church. I get envious of these people in football games. They're shouting, they're, they're screaming, they're raising hands, they're jumping over a piece of pig skin flying through the air. We serve the most high God. And so, Lord, we lift our hands to you today in thanksgiving and praise. And I speak life and peace to everyone listening under the sound of my voice. Come on, Southwest, lift your hands up, those online. I just command peace into the midst of the storm of every life here in Jesus' name. I command a great calm to come in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. The word for us is to fear not. You're with us right now. Lord, I speak life and peace and blessing. Father, I thank you. You said you're with us in trouble. I do sense the Lord quickening this to me that there's some of you I mean, you're so earnest, you are so diligent, but you're trying to do it all on your own. You've got to bring the Lord into your situation. How do you do that? Faith is what provokes God to move in your behalf. Some of you are wondering, Lord, I just wanna please you and I'll tell you how you please him, get in faith. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by his spirit. The arm of flesh will always fail. And I'm here to tell you, just just worship him. Lord, we, we lift up the hands that hang down right now. I just feel there's release starting to happen in Jesus' name. Lord, we invite you into every life right now, every situation, every 
troubled waters, every bit of storm. And I thank you, you are Lord of the storm. And that Lord, just like the early church, like your disciples, you ask, where is our faith? Where is your faith? And we say, Lord, peace be still. We take authority over the storm. There's somebody here or listening and you've really been battling, Lord, did I cause this? Did I cause this? Am I the reason? And you're wondering if the Lord's willing to help you. And this is what I hear the Lord saying, that your storm is because of your obedience, not because of disobedience. Now, whoever that may be, you'll know it by your spirit. But I'm here to tell you, remember there's three storms. There's Jonah's storm. That's from an act of rebellion. There's the storm of Paul, that's other people's disobedience. But then there's the disciples' storm. And that's because of perfect obedience. Somebody needed to hear that today. And I'm telling you, the way that you get through that storm is you take authority over it. Jesus stepped up to the plate, but he wanted them to do it. So you now exercise your authority against that storm. You have authority whether you feel it or not. And in closing today, if you've never been born again, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life online or at the Southwest campus or here, I wanna invite you to receive the Lord right now into your heart. The prayer does not save you, it's your trust in Him. It's your saying, Lord, I receive you into my life. I invite you in, I ask you to be Lord of my life. And if that's you, we're gonna pray this out loud and you pray it out loud. We're all pray together. Say this with me, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my savior and I make you Lord of my life. And I thank you that I'm now saved. In Jesus name, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise for his word today.